welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're continuing House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. And as always, I will have links to the last couple weeks of reading down below in the description. So definitely you would want to watch those first if you haven't been following along already, because we are jumping right into chapter four. The first thing I spotted at the breakfast table was Morella's blue satin dress. Fleets of white organdy wound around her elbows and a choker of pearls dotted her neck. It dazzled like a jeweled hummingbird in a room full of covered portraits and crepe wreaths. She looked up from the side table as she picked through the trays of food. Highmore kept a relaxed morning schedule. Everyone drifted in and out of the dining room, serving themselves. Good morning, Annalee. Morella added a gingered scone to her plate and slathered it with butter. Did you sleep well? In truth, I had not. Verity was a restless sleeper, lashing out like a mule whenever she turned. My mind kept wandering back to Yulali and the cliff walk, too full to properly doze. It was well after midnight before I drifted off. Hello, my love, Papa called out from the doorway. We turned, both assuming his greeting was for us, but he crossed over to kiss Morella good morning. Though his frock coat was dark, it was a sooty charcoal, not the raven black I'd grown accustomed to. How well you look, he said, turning her in a circle to admire the barely discernible bump. I think pregnancy agrees with me. She did radiate a flushed happiness. Mama's pregnancies were full of terrible morning sickness, with bed rest prescribed long before the usual confinement period. When I was old enough, Ava and Octavia let me help with her care, showing me the best oils and lotions to ease her pains. Do you think so, Annalee? Marilla asked. I supposed she was trying to be kind, including me in the conversation. I studied the bright lapis satin. She looked lovely, but it was the wrong thing to wear the day after laying a stepdaughter to rest. Are you Lolly's dresses already too small for you? Mm hmm? Oh, yes, of course. She used the moment to run a satisfied hand over her stomach. Actually, Papa interrupted, reaching over to add a pile of kippers to his plate. We have something to discuss with everyone on that very subject. Annalie, can you get your sisters? Now, I glanced at the eggs I'd just spooned out. They would not keep warm. Please? Purposefully leaving my half-assembled plate on the center of the table, I trudged upstairs. I was an early riser, but not all my sisters shared my morning habits. Mercy and Rosalie were absolute bears to wake up. I chose Camille first. She'd opened the curtains, letting weak gray light play over her rich, plum-colored furnishings. I was surprised to see her in front of her vanity, stabbing a pin through a lock of hair. Though her lips and cheeks were bare, pots of color and cut glass vials of perfume lay scattered over the tabletop. A black crepe cover, twin to the one shrouding my own mirror, was crumpled at her feet. I wondered when she'd thrown it there. Back from breakfast already? she asked. Papa wants everyone downstairs. He has something to tell us. Her hand paused over a box of jewelry, then reluctantly picked up a jet black earring. Did he say what? I sat next to her on the bench, running fingers over my own chignon. I hadn't seen my reflection in nearly a week. Morella's blue dress said plenty. Eulalie would have an absolute fit if she knew what was going on. Do you remember after Octavia died when Eulalie wanted to go see, what was it, a traveling circus or something? And Papa wouldn't let us leave the house. He said, I deepened my voice to a close approximation. Grief such as ours, shouldn't be seen by the public eye. And Octavia had been gone for months. Yulali sulked for weeks. And now we honor her by wearing black for, what, five days? Papa is already wearing gray. It's not right. My sister opened a jar and examined the wine-colored lip stain. I agree. Do you really? I asked, pointedly looking at the mirror. I took the pot away from her, spilling some of the color in the process. Running down my fingers, it looked like blood. She smoothed out a stray ringlet. I never was any good at doing my hair without a reflection. I would have helped. What if you lolly? 
Camille rolled her eyes. Eulalie's spirit won't see a shiny surface and get stuck there. She could hardly stand being in this house during life. What makes you think she'd want to stick around in death? I set the lip stain down, unsure of what to wipe my fingers on. You're in a mood. She offered me a handkerchief. I slept poorly. I couldn't get Ligeia's stupid comment out of my head. She picked up a different shade of stain and wiped a small sheen of berry across her mouth. Guilt weighed heavy on her face. I'll never get a husband if something doesn't change. That's not true, I protested. Any man would be honored to have you at his side. You're clever and every bit as lovely as Eulali. She smirked. No one was like Eulali. But if I hide myself away in this gloomy house, buried under layers of crepe and bombazine, I'll never find anyone. I don't want to disrespect the memory of Eulali or any of our sisters, but if we go through every step of mourning each time someone dies, we'll be dead ourselves before we finish. So, I'm ready to move on, and no amount of hangdog looks from you will change my mind. I picked up the mirror cover, sinking my fingers into the dark fabric. I wasn't upset with Camille. She deserved to be happy. We all did. We all had dreams of greater things. Of course, my sisters would rather be out, at court, at concerts, at balls. They wanted to be brides, wives, mothers. I'd be a monster to begrudge them that. Still, I clung to the cover. Papa wants us downstairs, Rosalie called out, interrupting our moment. The triplets crowded in the doorway, peering in. Caught in the strange morning light, their reflection was a grotesque mass of limbs and braids. For a second, they were one conjoined entity, not three separate sisters. Lenore broke free of the clump, clearing the strange vision from my mind. Will you tie this for me? She held out her black ribbon. Rosalie does it too tight. She knelt beside Camille, lifting her heavy braid to expose the pale length of her neck. The triplets wore their ribbons as chokers. When we were little, Octavia delighted in telling us lurid, spooky stories at bedtime. She'd conjure up tales of pining damsels wasting after their true loves, ghosts and goblins, tricksters and harbingers, and the foolish people who bargained with them both. Later, certain we were still cowering in terror under our covers, she and Eulali would creep into our rooms and snatch the blankets from us. One of her favorite stories was of a girl who always wore a green ribbon around her neck. She was never seen without it, at school, at church, even on her wedding day. All the guests said she made a lovely bride, but wondered why she chose to wear such a plain necklace. On her honeymoon, her husband presented her with a choker of diamonds, sparkling like mad under a starlit sky. He wanted her to wear them, and only them, when she came to bed that night. When she refused, he stalked away, upset. Later, he returned to find her asleep in their big bed, naked save for the diamonds and the green ribbon. Snuggling next to her, he stealthily removed the ribbon, only to have her head roll off her body, neatly severed at the neck. The triplets delighted in that horrid story and asked for it again and again. When Octavia died, they wrapped black crepe around their necks with ghoulish affectation. Bow securely tied, Lenore twisted it around to a jauntier angle. The graces are already downstairs. We woke them first. Camille rose from the bench. When I offered out the cover, she tossed it aside, leaving the mirror bare and sparkling. Mercy, Honor, and Verity sat at the far corners of the dining room table. The older girls worked on plates of eggs and kippers. Verity had a bowl of strawberries and cream, but pushed the berries around without eating. I noticed she sat as far from Honor and Mercy as she could, without actually switching seats. Apparently, she'd not yet forgiven them for their late night prank. We didn't bother making up plates of our own. Papa sat at the head of the table, obviously wanting to announce his news. He started without preamble. After breakfast, there is a marvelous surprise for all of you in the gold parlor. The gold parlor was small and formal, used only for important guests, visitors from court or the high mariner. Many years ago, the king and his family came to stay with us during their summer progress, and Queen Adelaide used it as her sitting room. She'd complimented the shimmering damask drapes, and Mama vowed to never update them. What is it, Papa? Camille asked. After careful consideration, I've decided the time for our family's sadness is over. 
Highmore has spent too many years in darkness. I'm ending the morning. We buried you, Lolly, yesterday, I reminded the table, crossing my arms. Yesterday. My leg slammed back as someone kicked me under the table. I couldn't prove it, but I would have placed bets on Rosalie. Papa raised an eyebrow at me. I know this may seem premature, but... Very premature, I interrupted and was kicked again. This time I was certain it was Ligeia. Papa squeezed the bridge of his nose, warding off a migraine. You seem to have something you'd like to say, Annalie? How can you possibly think of doing this? It's not right. We've mourned too much of our lives away already. Now is the time for new beginnings, and I can't bear to have our fresh start cloaked in sorrow. Your fresh start, yours and Morella's. None of this would be happening if she wasn't pregnant. The triplets let out a stricken gasp. I saw hurt flash in Morella's eyes, but pressed on. Feelings be damned, this was too important. She said it's a boy, and you're ready to move earth and moon to please her. You're willing to forget all about your first family. Your cursed family. The word fell out black and ugly. Verity let out a noise halfway between a shriek and a sob. There's no curse, Lenore rushed to her side, snapping at me. Tell her there's no curse. I don't want to die, Verity wailed, knocking over her bowl of cream. You're not going to die, Papa said, gripping the arms of his chair so tightly. It was a wonder the wood didn't splinter. Annalie, you're out of line. Apologize immediately. I rose and knelt beside Verity, hugging her and stroking her soft hair. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. There is not really a curse. Papa's voice was cold and flat. I didn't mean Verity. I pressed my lips together in silent defiance. Though my knees felt weak, I willed myself not to look away from him. Annalie, he warned. I counted the seconds ticking by on the little silver clock on the mantel. After two dozen passed, Camille cleared her throat, drawing Papa's attention. You said there's something in the parlor? He rubbed his beard, suddenly looking far older. Yes, it was Morella's idea, actually. A treat for you all, he sighed. To celebrate the end of our mourning, we brought in dressmakers to design new clothes, milliners and cobblers too. My sisters all squealed and Rosalie rushed to Papa, then Morella throwing her arms around their necks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I kissed Verity on the top of her head and stood up, intent on returning to my room. I didn't want new clothes. I was not going to forget the old customs, bribed by shiny baubles and silks. Annalie, Papa called out, stopping me. Where are you off to? As I have no need of new clothes, I'll leave you to them. He shook his head. We are all coming out of mourning, you included. I'll not have you in drab weeds while the rest of us get on with our lives. I sucked in my breath, but the fiery barb could not be contained. I'm sure you lolly wishes she could get on with her life as well. He was across the room in three quick strides. My father wasn't a violent man, but in that moment, I truly worried he might strike me. Grabbing my elbow, he pulled me into the hallway. This obstinacy will end now. Drawing on metal I didn't know I possessed, I shook my head, openly defying him. Go, move on since you're so set on this new life. Leave me alone to mourn my sisters as I see fit. No one can move on if you're wandering about the house draped in black, never letting them forget. He turned toward the window with a curse of frustration. When he looked back, deep creases wrinkled his forehead. I don't want to fight, Annalie. I miss you, Lolly, as much as you do. Elizabeth and Octavia and Ava, too. Your mother, most of all. Do you think it brings me joy to have returned half my family to the salt? Papa dropped onto a small conversation bench. It was too low for him and his knees buckled to his chest. After a moment, he gestured for me to join him. I know most men want strapping young sons to follow after them, to take over the estates, to carry on their names. But I was always proud to have so many girls. Some of my best memories were with the eleven of you and your mother, playing dress-up, picking out dolls. I loved those times. And when Cecilia was pregnant with Verity, 
It was such a wonderful surprise. When she passed away, I thought I'd never have happiness like that again. A tear fell, running down the end of his nose. He pushed it aside, gazing at the tiles beneath our feet. Small chips of sea glass made a mosaic of waves crashing down the hall. After so many years of tragedy and sadness, I have the chance to grab that happiness again. It's not as complete. How could it be with so many gone? But I need to take it while I can. The ribbon around my wrist was already frayed, and I toyed with the fringed ends, overcome with a sense of deja vu. Wasn't this exactly what Camille and I had just spoken of? I suppose these dressmakers might have some light gray silks, I reasoned, conceding. Cecilia always loved you in green, he confided, bumping his arm into mine. That's why she made your room up in all that jade. She said your eyes reminded her of the sea right before a big storm. I'll see what they have, I said, accepting his hand as he pulled me up. But you will not catch me wearing pink. Look at this satin. It's the most delectable shade of pink I ever saw, Rosalie exclaimed, hoisting the rosette cloth above her head. The gold parlor was a mess of fabrics and trimmings. Crates of bows and laces lay open like treasure chests, their contents spilling out. There wasn't a bare surface to be found. I'd tripped over three boxes of buttons already. Camille held a swatch of saffron up to her face. What do you think of this shade, Annalie? It suits you beautifully, Morella cut in. She was in the middle of the chaos, sitting on a tufted chaise long like a pampered queen bee. She hadn't looked at me since the incident in the dining room. I needed to find a way to apologize. Something blue would bring out your eyes more, I said, scooping up a bolt of cerulean. See, and it sets off your coloring. You look so rosy, don't you think, Morella? She nodded faintly, but turned to inspect a glimmering bit of ribbon Mercy pulled from a box. This chiffon is perfect for my lady, a seamstress said, stepping into the conversation. Have you seen these sketches yet? She offered Camille a handful of designs. We can have that made into any of these dresses. Camille took the drawings and sat on a poof covered in glittering pastel damasks. The seamstress knelt beside her, taking notes. On the rack near me, lengths of cream-colored linens and beautiful green silks rested on padded hangers. I'd selected three patterns for long flowing dresses and even a ball gown for the triplets party. Despite my misgivings, the seafoam tulle, dotted with sparkling silver paillettes like twinkling stars, made me giddy with anticipation. It would be a truly magnificent dress. Lenore opened an ornate box. Oh, look at these! Nestled inside the velvet lining was a pair of slippers. The silver leather looked as soft as butter and shimmered in the afternoon light. Silk ribbons were sewn on either side to tie around the ankle. These shoes were meant for dancing. Verity grabbed one and held it close to her face, inspecting the pattern of beads around the toe with awe. Fairy shoes! How stunning, Morella said, admiring the other. Reynold Gerver, the cobbler, spoke up. Each pair takes two weeks to make. The soles are padded for extra comfort. You could dance all night and your feet wouldn't mind at all come morning. Rosalie snatched the shoe away from Verity. I want a pair of them for our ball. No, I saw them first, Lenore protested. I want them. We should all get a pair, Ligeia said. She joined Morella on the chaise, touching the ribbons. We only turned 16 once. Camille looked up from the sketches. Can they be made in other colors? I'd love a pair in rose gold to match my gown. Gerver nodded. I have samples of all my leather here. He pulled a book out from under the discarded yellow fabric. He paused, eyeing Morella. Because these slippers are so unique, they can run quite dear. Quite dear? Papa's voice boomed from the doorway. I leave my girls alone for an hour, and you've spent me out of house and home, have you? Rosalie held up the shimmering slipper. Papa, look at this! These shoes would be perfect for our ball. May we get them, please? He looked at each of my sister's hopeful faces. I suppose you all want a pair? Us too? 
Honor asked, standing on tiptoe to peer over a stack of hat boxes. He kept his face as a neutral mask. I'll need to see them. One of the most important lessons of trade, never shake on an agreement until you've inspected the cargo. Rosalie gave the slipper back to Verity and nudged her. She stepped forward, holding it out with reverent, chubby fingers. They're fairy shoes, Papa. He turned it over and over again with theatrical interest. Fairy shoes, you say? Her round eyes, the same green as mine, beamed. They seem awfully delicate, very insubstantial. The cobbler stepped forward. Not at all, I assure you. They will last a whole season's worth of balls. I make my soles from the finest leather in the kingdom. Flexible, but tough. Papa looked unconvinced. How much for eight pairs? From the chaise, Morella sniffed. Nine pairs, Papa corrected. Nine pairs delivered before the end of the month. My daughters are having a ball. We'll need them ready by then. Gerver whistled through his teeth. That's not much time. I'll have to bring in extra hands. How much? Gerver counted on the tips of his fingers, then adjusted the gold spectacles hanging from the end of his nose. Each pair is 175 gold florets. But to have nine pairs made up in only three weeks, I couldn't charge less than 3,000. The room's playful mood died away. There was no chance Papa would agree to such extravagance. I couldn't begin to calculate what the new dresses and underpinnings were already costing him. Surely nine pairs of shoes won't send us to the poorhouse, Orton, Morella prompted with a winsome smile. Verity stood on her toes, watching his expression with rapt attention. He knelt beside her. Do you really think these slippers are worth all that, child? She looked back to us, then nodded. His face broke into an unexpected grin. Go on, then, and pick yours out. Fairy shoes for everyone! All right, we still have two more chapters left to go over the next two Fridays. So I hope you'll join us back here next Friday and have a great weekend. Bye.